Hello everyone, I hope you enjoyed this morning's talk by Professor Jasper Van Wetzel, but it's now time for our second talk of the International Conference. And it is my great privilege to welcome Professor Mamogeti Paken, the Vice-Chancellor of the University of Cape Town. Now, um, Professor Paken has a PhD in mathematics education and has held many roles of responsibility throughout her career. She has been awarded the Order of the Baobab Silver by the President of South Africa in 2016. And actually in 2019, the University of Bristol, that's us, also awarded her an honorary doctorate in, sci in science for her um, leadership role in mathematics education in South Africa. Chaos would usually donate some money to go towards um, our speakers' travel costs. But instead, given the current climate, um, we're going to be donating to the Mamogeti Faken Scholarship Fund, which the professor set up herself to support the most deserving students at the University of Cape Town. So we are promised the most incredibly inspiring talk this afternoon. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to the professor. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Eden. Thank you for the kind introduction. So I have entitled my, my, my talk, A Disruptive Presence with a subtitle that says, the making of an academic with a social conscience. You might be sitting there and asking, why a disruptive presence? Here's the thing, I'm, I'm getting to make peace with the fact that my presence is a little disruptive, not because I wanted to, but because that's just what it is. And so I've been looking back in my career and in my life in general, trying to understand this, disrupt, this disruptive nature of my being and thinking, can I do anything about it? Well, over 50, it's too late. Nothing I can do about it. So I've decided to embrace it. I'm a disruptive presence, but disruption is not always a bad thing. Disruption can be a good thing. But how did this disruptive presence come to emerge as an academic with a social conscience? I start with a warning. And there's a good reason I start with a warning is because of the disruptive nature, right? So now consider yourself warned. This presenter has a tendency to be funny, to be passionate and use words and phrases from a variety of African languages in her speech. She doesn't think about it all the time. It just happens. So when it happens, no offense, right? That's just how it happens when I get passionate, right? The presenter also has got a tendency to use examples from her own experience as an academic because that's the experience she understands best. It's not the only experience, but it's the experience she understands best. And today, because she's talking about her career, it's even going to be worse that she would refer to her experience, her journey, but not necessarily the best, but the one that she understands the most. So this presentation may be offensive to anyone who doesn't have a sense of humor or those people who are allergic to languages they don't understand or those people who tend to be irritated by my passion and those who interpret using examples from my own experience as arrogant or self-promoting. Let me tell you this, no need to self-promote. I am okay, right? I'm using examples to help illustrate what I'm talking about. Okay, now I wanna start by talking about the difference between a career and a job. And the reason I'm doing that is because in my career, in my journey, I have found what has helped me make decisions about what to do, when, how, with who, is understanding very clearly the difference between a career and a job. And I then made a decision that what I want to do is to pursue a career, not a job, not just a job. I understand that I'll do a job, but I said, I'm building a career, all right? And a career is not necessarily tied to your current job or whatever job you want to do, but career is not tied to your job. It's not tied, tied to your performance agreement. It's not tied to your job description. It, 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 it's really about you and where you want to be. A career 
actually is bigger than your job, right? A job is what you do for someone else, but a career you do for yourself. So when you think about a career, don't think, I don't think money, I don't think uh, feeding my family. I think the legacy that I want to live, right? A job will help you pay your bills, but a career will help, help you live a legacy. And so if you do it with great passion, with determination, with commitment, in spite of the many challenges, then it's a career. If you're not waiting and saying, well, they haven't given me a desk that's got this piece of glass, then it means it's, it's a, you, you're not complaining about the circumstances. You're looking at, you're looking at what, what you build it here, which is much bigger than a job. So whether it's a corner office or not, there's a time where you understand this is not about what I'm about. I'm about something bigger. And so I'm currently vice chancellor. But when people ask me what I do, actually, even when I fill forms, I, I write academic. I don't write vice chancellor. Because I understand that vice chancellor, it's my job right now. I love it. I do it with passion and so on. But I'm, a, I'm essentially an academic. And of course, at UCT, I, keep, I hold two positions. One is a professor. The other one is VC. They are separate, so there's two positions there. So I had. In terms of building this career, if you're working towards building a career, then it is important to understand then what's this career that you're building? What's the nature of this career? And for an academic, I understood that it's an intersection of three things, your research, teaching, and social responsiveness, or what other people would call community engagement, and, and so on. So the three things work together. And then I thought, but they, it, these things don't just hang on together. There, there's a whole lot of things that go with it. There's lots and lots of admin, there's teaching to a higher standard, there's caring about students. And, and that's me right there, that I, I, I take this and I say, but I don't just teach just to tick things because I'm building a career. So I'm teaching to a higher standard, I care about my students. I build collaborations because I understand the importance of that for, for, for research work hard to win grants, you go to conferences, you publish in high quality journal, you engage communities, you do external examining, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's a whole lot of things that make these three circles hang together. Of course, later, if you want, you can ask me, I mean, is it possible that you can be in a, you can be building a career and being in a job that's got nothing to, you, to do with your career. Yes, it is possible. So if you think about it, you are doing physics, so you'll understand this better. Think about it as uh, two circles, right? So you can have a career and a job separate, a career, a job. You can have a career and a job, two intersecting circles, or career and a job, concentric circles, one inside the other. The ideal situation, in my view, is if your career is bigger and the job is inside. But it's not a train smash if we have other, other um, uh, 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 arrangements and, and, and we can talk about that. But where did this start? I mean, I'm vice chancellor right now, but people don't actually know that I started as a, as a, as a mathematics school teacher. I majored in mathematics, pure mathematics, and, um, um, and I did mathematics education in my PhD. That's my area of research. But I actually started my career as a teacher. And then I went on to be a subject advisor. In South Africa, we've got people called subject advisors or curriculum advisors who work with a group of schools. And then I worked in, in 1994, actually, when South Africa got its, um, when, we first, our first, we, when we had our first democratic elections, we had them on the 27th of, of April. And that month of April, I decided to resign from a government job as a subject advisor to go and be to go into the NGO world and be a mathematics trainer. Um, and we can talk about the complexities of making that kind of decision when you after your uh, democratic elections, but it was tricky. Many people thought it's a bad decision. Why go into an, 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 an unstable space? Uh, I had an 18 month contract in the NGO, but I went. I was 25, I thought I was young, and I thought if it doesn't work, I'll go start again, because I thought I need that experience. I spent about six years in the NGO world, and frankly speaking, it was the best time of my career. 
well as a young person. I had I worked in two different NGOs, but one of the NGOs that I worked in, I was working only with farm schools. And during apartheid, uh, there were different kinds of schools, there's townships, there's uh, all sorts of schools, they were racially divided, but even within African people, there were farm schools, there were rural village schools, and then there were township schools. So I worked in farm schools and farm schools are schools that were owned by farmers. Okay, so a farmer has got land, they do whatever kind of farming, and they start a school for children of farm workers. Um, and when I say farmers do that, it sounds like a good thing. Some farmers were amazing. I mean, if you know Gary Player, the golfer, he also is one of the people who was a farmer who started a school in his farm. It was like the top school ever. I mean, at that time in the mid 90s, and, and they had all sorts of equipment, computer labs and teachers quarters and all sorts of things, taking care of the teachers and the learners. So you, get, you had one upmarket farm school like that. And then we had the lowest farm school where the school would have been a, 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 a horse stable and the farmer converts the horse stable into a classroom. Uh, they don't do anything to it. They literally take out the horses and poop the children. And uh, typically there would be three classrooms, three grades uh, in one classroom and maybe one teacher because the farm maybe um, has got 50 families. So it's, children of those families. Um, and it, it was very unresourced. And the farmers, the farmers, so the, the schools differed in that way and everything in between. There was a variety in between, right? But also the farmers differed in behavior. So in some of the schools I worked in, farm schools that I worked in, the farmer would lock the gates. In the morning at six o'clock, he would go out, lock the gate when he gets out. And the next time the gate gets open is when he comes back. All right, anyone who comes in, any of the children or the workers, whatever who comes in, will have to jump the fence or whatever. So I would have to be there at six o'clock as an NGO worker. And then uh, in the morning, I would work with the, teach with the children in class. In the afternoon, I would work with the teachers and wait until the farmer comes. When he comes in, I go out. And that was it. But I was 25, it was amazing. What was I doing there? It wasn't charity. It was, I, I committed myself to making sure that the children love mathematics. I figured that um, they will never pass mathematics if they don't love it. So I, I, I changed my way of looking at what I'm doing to saying I want them to love mathematics because if they love it, they will be excited to learn it. They will come to class all the time and they will study it at home. And in my teaching career, that's sort of been my light, guiding light in terms of teaching mathematics was you make them love it um, and we can talk about how you make them love it. But, but, but that's, that's what I did. I had another good fortune in the second NGO that I worked with. I did mathematics training, but I also had an opportunity to do women in rural, to, to do training of women in rural areas. And you may ask, so how does this happen for a maths major and an NGO to do women in rural areas? Well, we had donor money. It was after 94, it was 96. And um, um, this company wanted to do work, empowerment of women in rural areas across the country. We've got nine provinces. So they needed um, people to work in the nine provinces uh, doing um, uh, women empowerment. And the NGO said, wow, we had this opportunity. I raised my hand and I said, I'm passionate about women issues. I would like to do that. Uh, they said, how? I said, I'll learn. So I took this and we had a year. Each one of us in each province, you have a year to work with the women. At the end of the year, the mandate was they've got to have a, an income generating business. All right. Now, they didn't tell you where the women came from. You don't select the women. There were 40 women. You've got to make sure that they, they have their business. Now, I chose the Limpopo province, which is up north in the country. Why did I choose that? Because my husband is from Limpopo. I'm not from Limpopo. I don't know the culture properly. And I thought, mm, this is a good opportunity to get to know the people in another way, not because they're my in-laws, but to, to, to get in to get to know them and doing something that I'm passionate about. Got there. What I did then, remember I was still doing women, uh, mathematics. So I spent one week in Limpopo working with the women and the rest of the three weeks 
working with the, with the schools. And working with the women, I structured it in this way that how do you empower women? How do you empower women? I found that when I got to Limpopo, by the way, the 40 women that I had, none of them had ever worked for someone. They only work in the fields, in their fields um, uh, uh, in the village. And um, only about 20% or less of them could read and write. And the levels of reading and writing were very, were differed uh, tremendously. Some of them were very low, uh, but many of them had never even been to school because this is what the apartheid government had, had created. So, you know, so. I thought, how do you make a group of women, majority of whom don't know how to read or write, do you spend time teaching them how to read or write, or do something, do you do something else? I figured, you know, I don't want to come here and make people feel that they are lacking something and teach them how to read or write. I want to start by working on themselves because if I work on self-empowerment, what do you bring to the table? So I focus on culture, how they do things, had sessions where they taught me things and I, I, you know, affirmed the things that they do and then I could teach them things. So I started with self-empowerment. And then because it was 96, 97, um, the, our constitution had just come out uh, being published. The second part of the training focused on um, the, the Bill of Rights, their rights as women. Okay, and when we did the self-empowerment, every time I go away, I give them tasks. You do this task you do, do, in groups. Some go to talk to the chief, some go to talk elsewhere, just like that, so that they take over the job, that I don't have to go and negotiate with the chief, they go. But they can tell me how they will do it, so that in the process, I'm learning culturally, how are things done in a way that if you want to get a yes. So teaching them, persuasion skills but in terms of talking with them first before they go to the, the to the chief and when I come back they do that so my passion for women in rural areas came in handy there the third bit was entrepreneurship skills that's when I contracted someone else at an institute nearby to deal with them in that way and then you may be thinking how did we then deal with the issue of reading and writing Reading and writing became something on a side. It wasn't the focus. So they started teaching one another. And young people started coming, teaching them how to read or write. But we didn't problematize it and make it an issue that if you can't read or write, you cannot run or have an income generating business. A year down the line, they had a bakery, they had a chicken run and, and vegetable gardens. And our project became the winning project out of the nine in the country. And there we go, we traveled with the women. I traveled with the women to Malaysia to see other women in rural areas projects. Finally, the one thing that I did, I do is my class, is classroom research. I mean, I told you that I studied mathematics, but I went into mathematics, um, uh, mathematics education for my research because before I got to the PhD, I was teaching, I did my PhD part-time and I was teaching and something that I became passionate about was language, the language of learning and teaching. How do learners, children who are not fluent in English, but learning mathematics in English, how do they acquire mathematical concepts? How are they taught if, if the language of learning and teaching is, is, is English? What happens in the classrooms? What do how do teachers teach? And how does that lead to them acquiring these concepts? And we can talk about that later. But what I'm showing you here is that what became my career was mainly informed by my passion. My passion for community development, for youth and women empowerment. So it landed, you know, these things that I'm, I'm doing sort of land very comfortably in, in, in the area of my passion. But of course, there is passion and then there is career. Sometimes young people stop at passion and they say, I've got passion for this, it's gonna work. Your career needs to be built. It's your business, you've got to build it, right? Passion will continue, but with passion, if I just ran on passion, I would not have published. I, there are a lot of things that I wouldn't have done because I would have still been busy with the passion stuff. Has the passion got? No, it is still here, right? It is still here, but the career is energized by the passion and that's what made it work. That's what made it work. Now. 
If you're gonna get into a research career or an academic career, my view is got, or, or even if it's not an academic career, by the way, I think you've got to plan your career. You've got to think about it because it's your business. And I thought about it in this way, where do I want to be when? I indicated the critical benchmarks, uh, what will I be looking at? How will I know that I'm making progress, right? And, and, and in your area, you will have to decide, how will you know that you're making progress? Okay, so for me, in my area, getting a PhD was an important um, a benchmark to say, if I want to be an academic, a successful academic, go to get a PhD at some stage, go to publish in high quality journals, journals, there are journals that uh, are there, but they, they are low quality. And so I made it my business to learn about journals so that I know what's low quality, what's high quality, so that I understand um, the, the, the politics of um, uh, um, um, predatory journals. I also figured that research grant applications are key in this business. You've got to figure out, given what you want to do, what is it that matters? Postgraduate supervisory throughput is important. And in South Africa, we've got something that's called a rating as a scientist, all right? So I pursued a, 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 this route of getting an, a, a rating by the National Research Foundation. It is not compulsory. It is not compulsory. People choose. I went for it. And I'll tell you why. I went for it because we have a history in our country. We have a history of apartheid. People like me are not, you're not automatically assumed to be smart, hardworking, and have achieved stuff. And I thought, I've got to get this rating so that I seal this deal. Because every time I pop up, people think, ah, this one just bats an eyelid and gets a promotion. So I put, put, pursued an NRF rating. The rating expires every five years. So every five years, you've got to apply. They only consider the past eight years of your career, not anything beyond. And it's a peer review system. And it's, it's an, a, 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 an international team of peer reviewers who look at your work and um, the work that you submit according to the criteria that's put up. And then uh, there's a team then that looks at the review reports and decides whether you get a rating or not. So I went for that because I felt I needed. You've got to decide what works, what, what will work for in your career. How do you navigate the journey? I don't think building a career is so separate from yourself, right? So there's always politics in the career. There's always things that can hold you back. So what is it that extra that you need to do in your space to make sure that you succeed? I, I also put the invitations to keep, keep keynote speakers, academic keynote speakers as a benchmark. And I also put research awards and I did deliberately look at the research awards that I don't want research awards where I have no competition and they're just giving me because, because, all right? I don't want that. So, Everyone has got to make decisions. And there's a good reason I did not put promotion on my list in an academic field. Um, uh, uh, and I know that it's the same every uh, in, in uh, across the world. Each university has got its own promotion criteria. And so if you put promotion, it really depends where, on in which university you are, you are, because you might move from one university as a professor, but another university might not appoint you as a professor. Certainly in South Africa is like that. And so I felt you've got to get the stuff. If they gave you professorship, that's great, but that's not what I'm working, working towards. I'm working towards getting the stuff that needs, the, the, the qualitative stuff that, that can position me that way. I'm gonna do this so that I run, because I'm talking to you, I'm gonna run to the career trajectory. So my career trajectory, I, I said to you, I have taught before, but if you look at this, you'll see that I taught at the college, I taught at high school. I was fortunate to be principal of a newly established school with no building. And let me tell a little story because every journey has got challenges and, and if you're gonna succeed in any career journey, you're gonna meet those challenges. One little story about when I was, how I was appointed and how I served as principal of the school. After working as a lecturer at the college, as a mathematics lecturer, got married, went to this other township in, in, in South Africa. And um, there was a new school that had no building. 
um, um, I applied to that school. Seven of us were there to be interviewed. We were interviewed. And um, at the end of the day, I got a call saying, you got the job and we are asking you to act as principal. And I was 23 then, 23. Um, and there I was, principal of a school that doesn't have a building and we, we have a platoon system where the, uh, the primary school is in the morning, the high school starts at 12. And that's what I was doing. I was super street, hardworking and disciplinarian. First year, um, things went well and the school fees uh, at that time was I think 20 Rand. 20 Rand is like one pound, right? It's like one pound. Even here uh, uh, at that time, it wasn't much money. It doesn't do much, it was a poor area. The second year, we continued that way building. I mean, we started the school from scratch, no furniture, nothing. It was a government school, uh, but I mean, it takes time to build school. So um, uh, they hadn't built a school even by the time I left. But yes, this, this is how I left the school. The second year, the beginning of the year, um, uh, three months into the year, we have athletics students, um, they go to the athletics, they, they get to win some students and they have to go to the regional competitions. So the students go to the regional competitions uh, on a Friday, they're supposed to leave. Friday morning, they're supposed to leave. They go with teachers and um, we buy provision for them. And then the teachers ask me, you, you know, we, we need some provision as teachers. So we give them provision, food, you know, food, money for food, whatever. But they say, no, we want alcohol. So I say to them, absolutely not. We're not being, buying alcohol with the school money. So I refuse, right? I put my foot down, the teachers go with the, with the students. When they came back, they, the competitions were on Saturday in another uh, region. When they came back, the students are very angry with me. The students really liked me. I was teaching mathematics the whole school. So, so the students, every student had, a, had an experience of being taught by me as much as I was principal of the school. The, after the assembly on Monday, two boys came to my class uh, to my office and said ma'am um we really think you must leave our school we don't want you anymore and i said why they said well you're not treating our teachers well our teachers are not happy so you must go so i thought oh okay i left i mean why it was it was 89 to 1990 it was the most tumultuous time in the country at that time in terms of riots, in terms of, and at that time it was 1990, the political organizations had been unburned. There were, there were protests everywhere. Many school principals' cars were burnt. People came out running. I thought, how lucky am I? They are not chasing me. They are not stoning me. They are not burning me. They're asking me nicely to leave. I left and I started volunteering in other schools. I phoned the, the inspector and I said, well, they don't want me because I won't buy alcohol. And sorry, um, um, Madam Inspector, I'm not gonna be buying alcohol with school money anytime soon, right? So, and then I left and, and started volunteering, teaching maths in other schools in the area. Looking back, I keep thinking, had I insisted on staying there, where would I be? Probably still there. Uh, it was a good thing to do that, but I did that because I thought uh, I've got other skills to sell. Sometimes you make key decisions, they're not popular, they're not easy, but if you're going to be getting into a leadership position in any area, at some stage, you have to make a decision. And sometimes that decision will not be popular, but that's what leadership is about. And when it's not popular, it will either come with a name or it might come with what came for me, that I had, I, I had to leave. I chose to leave, I could have fought, but I decided, no, I'm leaving. The career trajectory continues. The turning point happened when I get, got into academia and the way I got into academia was through, was through being a research assistant. Oftentimes people get an opportunity to be a research assistant and they worry that is too low. I had a master's degree. I joined this research group and became a research assistant, basically being a servant for the team. I ran, I did everything that a research, a research assistant needed to do. Coffee, literature searches, photocopying, packing boxes for data collection when we go traveling anywhere in the country. And that was good. Didn't only do that, 
I made the most of the opportunity, went to every conference that the team was going to present it. And when I finished my PhD in 2002, I also had publications in international journals. And it was thanks to being in a research a, a group as a research assistant. So if you ever get an opportunity to be an intern or an assistant, don't just go there and, and just lazy around because you're an assistant or whatever. Push, I can tell you that that space, when I call that a turning point, had I not been in that research assistantship job, I wouldn't have been able to have a career that moved as fast as, it, as my, my academic career did. It worked wonders for me. I've had an opportunity to have postdoctoral fellowship in the US. And as soon as I finished my PhD, I started my own, my own uh, research group so that I can, I can also be a mentor to other people who, who want to develop careers in academia. I'm gonna pause here. I know there's lots that I can tell, but I can see that we've been on, or my presentation has been on for almost 40 minutes. And I would like us, rather than just you listening to me, I would like us to have a conversation. So I'm, I, I want to pause Eden, Eden and, and ask for questions and points of conversation. I hope I've been provocative enough for people to want to talk to me. You've been brilliant. Thank you so, so much. It's so impressive. Um, but I, I just, I'll, um, anyone is welcome to interrupt me with your questions or um, put them in the chat, but um, I'll start off just so, because you, when I think of a career, I would think like, oh, in the future, I want to run my own business or I want to be a manager, but you don't seem to have that focus on an actual position. Yours is more of like a, I don't know, drive or what, how, how do you define what a career is then? You know, so I didn't have the name for my career. I mean, as you can imagine, if you, you come from a low socioeconomic background, I mean, it's, it's clearly for me, being an academic was an unthinkable. It wasn't something that I thought. It wasn't even in my realm of thinking. So I wanted to be, at the beginning, I thought, I'm going to be a brilliant mathematics teacher because I love mathematics. And that's why I started with teaching, you know, and, and it's when I started teaching, because my first job was as a college mathematics lecturer, I was there teaching mathematics to people who were going to be teachers. Then I got interested more in just more than just teaching to understanding more about, but how do you, because I had to figure out how do this, how will they teach? How will they know what, how to teach? Uh, it depends on the learners in my view. And so I, I, I got to read more about education, how children learn, the different theories, uh, different ways in which people teach and why. And, and it was, as it was spiraling that way, the only, the first time the idea of being an academic came up was when I was, when I was in the research group as a research assistant, or yes, uh, as I was finishing my master's. In fact, the woman who was running the research group was my master supervisor. She had supervised me in my honors project. And then I did my master's with her. At the end of the master's, I remember uh, that I went to submit and I talked about the career. But this is the reason why she became sort of uh, an inspiration for me. I mean, she had taught me at the honors level. And then at the master's, I chose her as a supervisor. But it's because I was fascinated about how she how she was engaging with us. I mean, and, and I'm talking about the context of South Africa where people like me don't get a second look, especially then, right? And here is a woman who, first of all, treats me like I can think and treats me like my ideas matter. And, and I thought, wow, this is great. And for the first time I thought, damn, I could do that. Um, because I used to look at how she did. There were many other people teaching us in the university, but somehow I was attracted to how she did it um, at a time when, when you know, it wasn't fashionable to be kind and polite and open and, and interested in Black African people's ideas, you know? And so when I submitted my master's, I said to her, um, I would like to have your kind of job. He, she asked me, so you submit your master's, what are you gonna do? 
I said, well, I'm going back to, um, I'm a BT. Well, I was, I was in the NGO at the time. I said, I know I'm going to continue teaching, uh, uh, teaching the farm schools, the work that I'm doing in the, in the NGO. And she said, is it for the future? What do you think you want to do? And I said, I want, I want your job, I said to her. And she said, my job? I said, yeah, 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 but not your job job, but your kind of job. And then she said to me, oh, wow, okay, sit down, let's talk. And then she started explaining to me, and that's the day she told me, if you want to be an academic like me, you're going to have to think about doing a PhD. I don't know whether that was her strategy to recruiting a PhD student <laughs> or whatever, but for me, I genuinely wanted a head job because I, I, really, I really felt that the way she was engaging with us certainly changed how I see myself. You know, it changed how I see myself, how I felt about myself as a student. I felt able, I felt capable. Like for the first time in my entire university career as a student, there I was with someone and they were white, a very Jewish white woman. And she made me feel like uh, I'm capable, man, I'm good, I can do this. And that was, yeah, that's what, what inspired me. That's when the idea of the career came in. Then I thought, if I want to be, if I'm going to be an academic, I must be the real one, the real deal. And, and then I started figuring out how to be there. And honestly speaking, I was looking at her most of the time. When we go to conferences, I would watch it. But she was also a good mentor, knowing how to mentor uh, someone who wants to be an academic once I had decided. Um, yeah, there are a few questions in the chat actually. I've, I've got some more, oh, gosh. Um, but uh, what part of your career do you enjoy? Oh, young people, man. Interacting with young people. I mean, yes. It's, it's like, yeah, and, and that's the greatest criticism I get as vice chancellor that I care about students more than anyone. That's the, that's the greatest. Unforgivable. <laughs> <laughs> that's not to say I agree with them all the time, but but I I I I enjoy the engagement uh, with students, intellectual engagements. Um, they don't always agree with me, and that's good. Um, and they push the boundaries, and um, um, their exuberance, this idea that you can make things happen, and you don't have to wait for three months or for six months, you want to make them happen and you want to make them happen now. You want to change the world to make it a better place, whatever that better is. Uh, I, 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 I honestly, that that's number one on my list of the things that I like the most. And, um, and being vice chancellor, I don't actually have to interact with students. As, as you know, I could sit in my office and be invisible and students can see me at graduation, all right? Um, and that's why my presence is disruptive because I, I don't do that. I go to residences, I was at, at residences on, on Sunday as they were arriving. I go sit in the dining hall to see what they're eating before they complain. I, I you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to the engineering uh, 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 home rooms. They've organized the teaching differently because of the COVID situation. And I, it's already on my diary. I'm gonna be spending a week there with engineering students seeing how is it working, whatever. I don't have to do that as VC. But, but I do that because it puts, uh, um, it sort of injects meaning in what I'm doing. The policies that we work through, all these management meetings and the big decisions that we have to make. Uh, I know that ultimately we will influence um, in a good way lives of many young people and so when i'm there interacting with them with them i get energized as this is not a waste look at the talent we have here actually this world is fine look at how passionate they are about uh, environmental sustainability look at how they are angry at me about gender-based violence that i must do something now look you know uh, uh, look at the arguments that they're making so so it's yeah it's students brilliant and you, you are an incredible public speaker and, and we've been asked for some advice in pu developing public speaking skills. I think a lot of students have presentations they're working on at the moment, as Orlando said earlier. So any advice there? All right. So, so I, I'll tell you the advice that I recently gave at an open day of Toastmasters. 
And, and I said to them, there are three C's. I hope I remember them. I said, the first C in terms of public speaking is content. Uh, why? Why should anyone listen to you? I mean, it's easy to get information these days. Why should they sit and listen to you? They can read about it. They can whatever. What is it about what you what what you doing that they should listen to you? That's number one. The second C, um, <laughs> I've got to remember, is context. That was my third C, by the way, in the speech. Was the third C was context. That when you speak, you're speaking to people in a in a time when different things are happening. So I can come to talk to you and um, um, a fire has just broken in one of your residences and it's all over the, oh, let's talk about the statue that was thrown into the river in Bristol. And I don't know about, or I don't, I, I don't show any awareness about what's happening in the context. So sometimes the understanding the context can help you connect uh, with the with the audience. Oh, then my second C was connect. Yes, my second C was connect. Uh, 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 let me go to connect. I'll go to connect. So connection was people want connection. So you can't just you can't just um, talk as if you're talking to wood or whatever. So your tone. The, the, how you pronounce, how you speak, your body language, or whatever. So actually, when I do a speech that's written, I don't do that anymore uh, in terms of how I write my speech, but this is good advice. When I started as a public speaker, I would write certain words in capitals to remind me to go up. So I would practice the speech and then to remind me, myself to go up, I would write it in capitals. I would put a full stop where I feel our or an exclamation where I feel this is then where you you do, but but I mean, <laughs> because my view is that if you're just monotonous, people tune out. People don't don't listen. They can read about this thing anyway, um, and then context, of course, is connecting things, connecting the dots in terms of what's happening in the world, or or if it's a major catastrophe that happened, um, it can help you create a context for your speech. It can be a good context for your speech. So the three, the three C's. Uh, but also, who's the audience? I mean, why are people there? Uh, uh, at birthdays, uh, people are not sympathetic. People will walk out of your, your speech if you're boring. At the funeral, people will sit and listen, not for you, but because of the dead person, right? So you've got to figure out what's, what's the deal here. Like right now, you could check out, right? You can check out and leave, who cares? Uh, because you don't have to stay here. So, so you always have to think, why are people here for the speech? Why would, why would they stay the whole hour whilst I'm there? So, so it matters um, how I come across, it matters uh, how I'm dressed, it matters, and so on and so forth. Because people can get this information elsewhere and they can walk out if they like. They don't have to sit here and listen. I, I don't think anyone's going to walk out now. But yeah. Thank you. I think I think we'll all take that on board over the next few weeks, I think. So thanks. Um, another question is, is, co oh, sorry. is confidence key for building a career? And did you ever suffer from imposter syndrome and feeling like you didn't belong in your job or that people were looking down on you? The imposter syndrome is always there. Definitely. I mean, I don't know about you. I always there like and and I, I and now I am convinced everyone it doesn't matter how big they are I am convinced even presidents have it they think the cat will be let out of the bag and we will all know that actually they don't know as much as they we think they do but you know so I've, I've given up on the the, the idea that uh, whatever but confidence confidence is key in the sense of if you're building a career because um, you, you can ask for help uh, without being scared, without being um, uh, apologetic. Not demand help, but ask for help. You know, you can admit when you don't know, uh, because that's the only way you, you, you're going to get to know, you know? Um, and, and, and you can also, sometimes confidence helps, maybe not so much confidence, maybe let's say, um, what would you say in English? You're daring, like you're not scared. Yeah, you you you, sh you shouldn't be like. I, I I think my nature is that I'm not scared. Okay, I'm not scared of things. So I would go into a context that I don't know, 
and I've never been, uh, but I want to learn, right? So, so nobody can, can tell often that, that I grew up in a poor, poor family, that I went to eight different, seven different schools in 12 years of education. Nobody can tell that. That my mother was a domestic worker, my dad drank too much, died of liver cirrhosis. Nobody can tell that, actually, you know. Um, but, 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 but I would get into the space and, and sit with people. When I started working as an academic, I would sit with people who knew more than I do. I mean, at some point, I didn't even know that there's something called head girls in schools because I went to poor schools. There was nothing like that. Head girl, what is that? We have class monitors. Now, what is that? And all these women who were in my space I was working with, they had been head girl at this school and that school. I was the black chick in the room. And not only were they white, they were top performing from like these girls who came throughout their school career, top performing and throughout their degrees, they've been getting distinctions and there I am with them. And, and I wasn't scared and I would sit and I would listen. So why are you writing it this way? Why are you doing this? So, and, and because you, 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 you can be comfortable asking the questions uh, that you want to ask. And, and frankly speaking, if you're not scared, you also have to be open to the fact that sometimes people will, people will laugh at you. And for me, it would be even things about how I used language because English is not my first language, right? So, so I, I can remember being, being, you know, uh, being corrected over lousy things like, uh, let's say, how you write lose and lose, like L O S E or L O O S E, right? Like, I mean, different meanings completely, right? And you know, so, so, but, but, but I don't care. I would still go in there and, and do it. So I think being bold is much more important than being just confident because sometimes confident, like I am boisterous. Sometimes that's what's described as confident, but people, there are people who are quiet and they're confident. They are bold, they're courageous, they'll go in and do things. And, and my mother would say, uh, I've got uh, uh, brothers and sisters and my mother would tell people that I'm the shyest one at home and people don't believe her, right? because I learned to come into spaces and it's like, I'm not scared to come into and, 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 and she knows, I mean, and I can see that my sister is much more boisterous than I am. I mean, it's much more outgoing than I am. I never brought it, I never brought a friend home. All of them did. I never brought a friend home, right? My sister would have friends. We went to the same university. Her friends would migrate to me because they become her friends and then they like me, right? You know, so, so I can see the things that why they are much regarded as more extrovert than I am. So it's not, I, I, I think maybe courage, boldness, uh, maybe they go with confidence, but, but I think it's important to be comfortable in your own skin and know that actually everyone is scared, you know, everyone, I mean, it's weird humans. I mean, every other human is worried about that the other human is better than them and they will find out that they are not actually as good as they, they were, right? So. Thank you. Really, really amazing stuff. Um, possibly not something so life changing, but I'd be really interested in to, to know more about how you sort of spread that passion to um, to your teaching and sort of what what sort of route you take to make people passionate in maths. What sort of route? What what sort of methods or um, any okay. any ideas? I'm trying to get better as a tutor. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, I, I, I think, I, I, think um, I always talk about teaching as an art, as a performance. That, and and uh, I, I mean, you obviously guys are not following me on social media, but I do, since May last year, I've been doing sessions on Sunday, online. Like I, I just, on Twitter, Instagram, and, and Facebook. So. Uh, if you go on to my Instagram, or, or Instagram will be easy to get because you just go to my IGTV, you get all my sessions and you'll see, you'll see what I do, you know, but I'm not teaching maths, I'm teaching postgraduate students, and then I go on to talking to talking to um, uh, uh, young academics, now I'm talking to students, you know, undergraduate students, you know, whatever, but, but you'll see First of all, even that is a boldness, right? No vice chancellor does that. And there I am, I go to social media and do lectures for postgraduate students. I start with writing a proposal and people thought I'm gonna get tired. I'm on number 48. I did number 48 on Sunday. 
This Sunday, I'm doing number 49, right? And we are on a roll, okay? So, so, so that's all. But I, I, I think it's an art. I don't think it's so much about um, uh, uh, what you know, is, is how you impart what you know. And so my first trick when I go teaching is that, as I said earlier, I said to you, I want to make them love mathematics, right? And, 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 and also being comfortable with the fact that sometimes I don't know, I don't know, I don't know what the next step is. I don't know what, and, and being comfortable with that makes, for me, it makes students realize that actually it's okay if at some stage they get to a point where they actually are not sure, but the issue is what do you do if you're not sure what is correct or not? Ha, huh, I see, he, she got, he got my handle. The Fab Academic is the one, right? On Twitter and on, on Instagram. But on Facebook, I go by my real name, but Facebook is boring, who wants to go there? So just go to Insta or Twitter. So, so, so yeah, so I take it as an art. I take it, it's not only the message, it's how the message is transferred. I, 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 I also take it that, um, uh, uh, it's about showing your love for the subject and your comfort uh, in the space of not knowing, because um, uh, today's learning is, a, is about that. I mean, uh, you know, I, I don't pretend to be an encyclopedia or a know-all. Wikipedia, I should have said that. I, I wanted to also know, you said it, your career shouldn't just be about passion, or there's a difference between a passion and career, and you're clearly very passionate, but how does how, where's the line between just being passionate and then focusing on your career and how, yeah, how do they you know, integrate? I, 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 I did that because I thought, you know, it's a, the passion alone would not necessarily um, have helped me achieve what I have achieved as an academic. Besides the passion, I needed to understand what's the business of academia? Do, do, do you know what I mean? So, the, so the passion help. The passion is a, it, it helps because I'm I'm in the area. You know, I'm an academic, but I'm I'm passionate about development, community, young people, whatever. So it's a space that what. But I've got to know the business. You know, what's the business? How do you get to one from one level to the other? How do how does universities work out? It helped me incredibly in making decisions. Uh, incredibly, and I know that because there are people I did PhDs with who come from poor backgrounds like me, and they made different decisions, but it's because they never thought about a career in the way that I did. It's not that they are not smarter. Some of them are smarter than I am. You know, the only difference is that it's figuring out, um, uh, uh, you know, what's the best, uh, I've got the passion, I'm not stupid, I'm hardworking, but what is it going to take? I've got to understand what is this business that I want to get into? What is this career that I need to get into? And that's what I mean when I say it's your business. So you can't let it be driven by passion only. Because if it's driven by passion only, my view is that at some stage you might be resentful that you're not making, you're not going, you know, you're not growing in your career. You're not going up the ladder because you're just driven by passion. Then I could, you know, I, I might end up, my desk is full of things. My, my, my to-do list is full of things. So for example, I, I, I make decisions like, um, you know, the minister of education, for example, after I got my PhD, there were, I was called to do a lot of things. The minister asked me to be on the task team for this and that, and people would be very happy. It's an honor. And I say, no. And people didn't understand, how can you say no? Like the minister asked you to be a member of the task team. And I said to them, but I need time. I need time. I want to publish. I'm still, my PhD is still new. And I had to explain to the minister, minister, I can't say yes. I understand that you need me, but I want to be a professor. And I do understand. I will not be a professor if I don't do one, two, three. I have a family. I have children. I have a job. And I have a career to build, right? And, 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 you know, but, but those kinds of decisions are not easy because if you want, if you are um, uh, uh, invited by the minister to be on a task team, it's, it's, a prest it's prestigious. It's like a vote of confidence. It's like people are so excited to write it on their CD, to tell everybody, and it's great and we need that. But I felt, of course I wanna do that, but I'm not ready. 
I go into this task team, I go one meeting, they're all professors and I'm here, I'm asking all the important questions, whatever, whatever, but they, they have, they, they are there, they have advanced, I'm a woman, I've got little children, I've got whatever, you know, so, so it's the thing about, but passion, my passion wants to be there. My passion would be fed very well in the task team, if you know what I mean. But it wouldn't, it, it, it would just still do the thing here, but this is immediate, you see. This, I've got to drive it. It's not driven by the minister. The thing about developing a career, I have to drive it. Whereas this one is sort of in extrinsic motivation. There's people, you're occasionally in the newspapers because you're producing this report and that report. And I thought I will do that. I will do that because I still have many years ahead, but I need to do this now. And this, it's intrinsic motivation. I've got to drive it. I've got to, and that's where I say it's it's your business. It is not, it, you know, it, it passion doesn't necessarily, it's not just passion that makes it or or anybody, it's your business. You drive it, you build it, you give it energy. So it's about being patient and building a strong foundation then. Did you say? Yes. Yeah. But, but remember that at some stage, it, it becomes, I mean, right now, I'll do, I'll, I'll chair a lot of things that the minister asks or whatever, you know, because, because you are at a particular level, you know, they, 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 but, but I often, I, I often look when I see young people doing those things and I feel like telling them, oh, I hope you are making time to build a career because Five years down the line, they are very, they are very resentful. They feel like they've contributed to the country. They've done this, they've done that, uh, uh, but now they, nobody recognizes them. You, you know, it's that kind of thing. But, but the passion drove them. They loved that. You know, so, so more than just building the, yeah, it's, it's understanding that at a certain, so at the beginning stage of your career, you need much more time and energy to build it, um, uh, uh, and, and it can't just fly just on the basis of passion. Gosh, okay, thank you. Um, does anyone else have any questions? I'm conscious that we're reaching our, our time limit. Um, so if anyone does have more questions, please put them in the chat. Um, if not, do you have maybe like three key pieces of advice on building a career or just in general <laughs> that you'd like to share with us? You know, I, I would say be intentional. I mean, I think many people are not intentional. Um, even at this stage, I mean, you don't wait until you finish your PhD to build your career. I mean, be intentional. I, and I can see, I mean, it's, it's amazing today how some young people are so intentional that um, even with the people that they get connected with, <laughs> you know, um, it, it, it's fascinating that there are young people, young South Africans who are elsewhere in the country. This Sunday are connected with someone because the person I was talking to on my session didn't, could not connect with technology. And this young man in the US connected. And suddenly there I am interviewing him, you know, having a conversation with him instead of the other one that I, because he couldn't connect, right? Um, and there's one that I'm mentoring who did his uh, um, uh, 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 undergraduate degree in, in, in Turkey. But, but, and then I wonder, how does this happen? I sit with them and I say, because now here I am, I'm mentoring them. A and then there's someone here who needs my mentoring, but they are, they are not pursuing me. They are just chatting with me, whatever. These ones are clear. They are not even at UCT, but they intentionally pursue me and they put their thing on the table. They, and they do it in such a way that I miss talking to them. I'm mentoring them, but they are contributing to me as well, if you know what I mean. So, so and, I, and I think young people, I think it's important to be intentional in what you're doing. That's not to say you, you abuse people or you, you are opportunist or what, no. It's just being clear about what am I doing? Why am I doing it? So you're not just chatting with someone just like that. You do your homework, you know what they do, you know what you want, you ask. If they say no, there's, you've got nothing to lose, fine. You move on to something else. You know? so, so I think intentionality is, is, is very important uh, among young people. And I say that to our young people here that, that just be intentional. Don't just be haphazard and you're just doing this. You'll see that many years from now, um, uh, 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 you know, what you do now will matter a lot 
the networks that you build, the decisions that you make, even about cultural societies that you belong to, how you give yourself to tasks and stuff like that. Um, and, and I think intentional people benefit much, much, much more uh, than, than people who are just haphazard and wake up late. Not to say they won't make it, some, some of them make it, but, but it's much harder, I think, these days. I gave one, but it's a long paragraph, so it's okay. Okay, fine. And, uh, yeah, it was very good advice. So thank you ever so much for coming. You have been incredible. I said this promises to be an inspiring talk, and I think it's gone above and beyond just an inspiring talk. So thank you so much. You're very kind. You are very kind, Vivian. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you. And you're getting well-deserved round of applause. So, yeah. <laughs> I'll see you. I'll see you again. I'm hoping to visit Bristol when the when things calm down. We'd love to have you in person. I'm sure we'd all be inspired just as much all over again to, to hear you speak. No, thank you very much. I didn't tell you that my first collaborator, by the way, international collaborator, was at Bristol. He was a student at Bristol doing his PhD. That was my first international collaborator. So Bristol holds a special place in my heart because of that. I mean, he's in Canada now, but yeah, he was in Bristol doing his PhD there. Anyway. Okay. Thank Wonderful. You. Thank you thank so, you so much. much. Enjoy the rest of your day, everyone. And yeah, thank you. Thank Thanks you. everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Damn. Whoa. Oh my God. What a legend. Oh my gosh. She's amazing, mob. Yeah, gosh, yeah. Um, um, you yeah. okay? Yes. Hello, Greg. By the way, great to have you with us. <laughs> um, yeah, I will see you back for for five. Um, just before. Um, Thank you for being here. Um, I, I don't want to put any pressure on you to turn up to everything. If you no, if no, you, wouldn't miss busy. it. I would like to. Um, absolutely. What's Bagnato? Um, um, quantum Brazil. turbulence. Yeah. Quantum Brilliant. Amazing. Great fun. Um, yeah. No, wonderful. I mean, as always, thank you very much for, for the, all, all the work you've put into it. I know it, how it feels to have a sort of pet project then sort of actually happen. No, but but, thank you. You've been a real support all the way. So. It's all going well. Brilliant. Um, I'm going to step outside for a bit to try and get some air, but see yeah. you later. Okay. Bye. Thank wonderful. you. Bye.